This talk is called In Praise of Higher Order Functions and of Some Friends and Heroes. And my intention with this talk is that you go away with, with a new hero. Um, so I'm hoping you'll pick one of the famous people I talk about in the talk and go away and read some of their papers, or at least go away and read one of the old papers I talk about. That's my aim for the talk. Um, why, why do I want to talk about higher order functions uh, apart from personal fascination? One is that it's a big part of the functional programming experience. Now, I'm a Haskeller, so the small bits of code I show you will mostly be in Haskell. This is a quote from the, the website called learnyouahaskell.com, which is a great place to go away and learn Haskell if you haven't tried it before. And they say higher order functions aren't just part of the Haskell experience, they pretty much are the Haskell experience. So it's a good idea to study them. I'm going to talk about three higher order functions only, map, fold, and scan. That's the, the topic of this talk. But there's plenty to be said about these three, three uh, functions. And I'm going to start with some history. I'm going to go back to 1959. I, I, I thought, if I'm going to talk about map, fold, and scan, I better find out who invented them. <laughs> so I went back, and I looked around and read some papers, and I found this page of the LISP manual from 1959, March 3rd, 1959, and it's got a, de a definition of a function called map list. And uh, on the top there's some text, some documentation, and on the, on the bottom there are two different implementations of map list. And I'll read out what it says on the top. It says, map list of LF, so it's got the list first, constructs a list in free storage whose elements are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the elements of the list L. The address portion of the elements of the new list at J, corresponding to the element at L, contains F of car of L. Car means head, uh, the, the first element of the list in, in Lisp. And then there's an implementation down at the bottom which he calls slow map list. And it says, if L is the empty list, then return the empty list. Otherwise, return cons of F of L and map list of cudder of L and F. Cudder means the tail of the list. Lisp. And this actually doesn't match the documentation because it, I would have expected to say at the bottom map list uh, uh, cons of car of F of car of L and map list of cutter of L, but it doesn't say that. So this is, this is a little bit of a surprise, a mismatch in the documentation. So it's not surprising that you, I look further in the list manual and I come to a new version of map list. And it looks like this. And my hope was that he would change the, the implementation of the function to add the car. But no, he changed the documentation to remove the car. So he's defined a function map list, which takes a list to a list of A to list of B functions, a function. And, uh, and if we visualize it like this, map list takes an F and first of all applies F to the whole list, and then F to the tail of the list, and then F to the tail of the tail of the list, and so on. So that's what map list in Lisp was. And I was expecting a different kind of map that would just take a function and apply it to each element of the list. Of course, you, that's called map car in Lisp, in Lisp, and it can be defined in terms of map list. But still, I, 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 he didn't get it the way I wanted it to be. But still, um, he went on to win the Turing Award <laughs> in 1971. Um, he's John McCarthy, who wrote those two manual pages, uh, is like the father of artificial intelligence and the, the developer of Lisp. I have had lunch with him once, but otherwise not really met him. I think some people in the room have met him, uh, like, for example, Phil. So if you want to know more about... Pardon? Yeah, so if you want to know more about John McCarthy, talk to Phil afterwards. Um, and I, I find it a bit fascinating to discover these two manual pages from the 3rd of March and the, and the 20th of March, 1959, because um, I was born exactly halfway between those two dates. On the 10th of March, 1959, oh. <laughs> so I was destined to be interested in higher order functions, you see, because I mean, LISP was being developed 
a map was being developed you know, in the middle of it all. So let's think back to 1959, though. For you, it's a very long time ago, even for me. What computers look like in 1959? Here's an example of a magnificent British computer called the Ferranti Pegasus. It was this particular one is at the Science Museum in London, unfortunately not still on show. And it was built in 1959. Um, it weighed 3,820 kilos. It cost 50,000 pounds despite not having any input or output devices. And it had 56 words of storage. Um, 40 of them were sold. 26 of Pegasus 1 and 14 of Pegasus 2. And it was considered a huge success. So this is what computers looked like in, in those days. Um, and the interesting thing ab about this computer is that it was regarded as the first user-friendly computer. <laughs> um, despite its 56 words of storage, okay? And the logical design of this computer was done by one Christopher Strachey. So I'm hoping this will be your new hero. And Christopher Strachey was a Renaissance man. So that's a new kind of hero, right? Um, he was from the British aristocracy, and he seemed to be able to do everything. <laughs> he was the first person to do computer music at all. That's preserved. It was the British national anthem that he got the computer to play. And um, he was also a super hacker in the positive sense, uh, uh, a great programmer. And what I'm going to sh talk about um, is uh, some, a program that he developed. So in 1961, he started to experiment with higher order functions. Uh, so MAP was already known, but he developed two higher order functions that he called in those days R1 and R2. <laughs> but they were fold R and fold L two versions of, of reduction. He lectured about them in a summer school in 1963 in Oxford, and then David Barron wrote up the, the lectures from a tape recording of the, of the lecture to make a paper that was published in 1966. And the title of the paper is wonderful. It's called Programming. <laughs> Those were the days when you could write a paper called Programming. Okay. And this paper... Uh, introduces map and fold and, and shows a number of different examples. And Olivier Donvi and Mike Spivey wrote a paper in 2007 nominating this paper as the first functional pearl. So this is like a, this paper from 2007 in ICFP, the, the Functional Programming Academic Conference, nominates this old paper as a pearl. So it's like a meta pearl, okay? Um, and the, the Donvi and Spivey paper is very nice. It explains uh, the examples that are in the, in the 1966 paper. Let's look at some of the higher order functions that are introduced there. The first one is map. This is written in a language called CPL, which was not implemented at the time. It was too, it was too fancy and too difficult to implement. Later, there was another language called BCPL, which led to, led to C. So how is map defined? It's defined the way we expect it to be defined, okay? Map of F on L is, if the, if the L list is empty, then return the empty list. Otherwise, return cons of F applied to the head of L and map of F applied to the tail of L. So this is a recursive definition of a higher order function map that applies F to each element of the list. We would write that in Haskell like this. So map takes a function from A to B and a list of A's and returns a list of B's. If you apply map F to the empty list, you get the empty list. If you apply map F to a list whose head is X and tails is, tail is X's, you get a list whose head is F of X and uh, whose tail is a recursive call of map applied to the tail of the list. So if we, you know, ask GHCI, the, 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 inter the Glasgow Haskell compiler's interpreter, what is map of a function times two or double applied to the list one to eight? We get two, four, six, eight, and so on. 
Now, because of my history, I have a bit of a tendency to visualize functions like map with pictures. I know it's disapproved of by many people, but I like to draw pictures to, to think about these higher order functions. So this is a, like a, an example of a, a higher order, a picture of map. The, the list comes in at the top. Its, its head is x, its tail is x's. And it applies the blob, the f, to each element of the list. So, uh, Strachey and Baron and Strachey introduced map in their paper. They also introduced a function they called list iteration, or fold. Uh, we call it fold these days. And here's the definition of that. It says, lit applied to f and a zero and a list is, if the input list is empty, return z, the zero, Otherwise, return f applied to the head of the list and a recursive call of lit with f and z applied to the tail of the list. This is the function we would today call fold r. It's called terms, and it's defined here. So it's, it takes a function from a to b to b, and a b, which is the zero, and a list of a's, and returns a, b, a, a single b. Um, if, you give it the, if you give fold R of F and Z the empty list, you get Z. If you give it a list whose head is A and tail is A's, you get F applied to A and fold R of F, Z, and the tail of the list, that is A's. And my visualization of functions gives... Uh, I just turned off... Is it still going? The blue box is an F applied to A, and the result of the, all the orange boxes, which are a recursive call of fold R applied to the tail of the list. So this is a way to visualize what fold R does. And if we ask GHCI, what does fold R of times on the list one to eight give us? It gives us what? What would you name this number as? Eight factorial, yes. And here's what's happening. It's, it's taking the list one, cons, two, cons, three, and so on, cons the empty list, and it's replacing each cons by the function times, and it's replacing the empty list by one. And then it, you get all the multiplications, and you get factorial eight. So that's what Foldor does to a list. It takes the cons and replaces them by a function, and it takes the empty list at the end and, and uh, replaces them by whatever zero you told it. So let's look at another example that Strachey has in his paper. What if we do fold R of cons and something? Let's say the singleton list X. So that square brackets thing is a singleton list containing X. If you do that, you get a function which takes the X and sticks it on the end of the list that you, you've given it. And I'm going to visualize that. So the, the, the thing with the boxes is a, a visualization of the fold R that does that. And on the right, I'm going to draw it a different way. The X is coming down and coming around and being added to the end of the list. And let's use fold R again. Let's do fold R of app and uh, the empty list and else. What does this do? Anybody guess? It takes the list in. And what does it do to the list? Reverse. It reverses the list. And this is an example also from uh, Strachey's paper. So rev of L is just fold R of app and the empty list in L. So you can do a lot of interesting things with uh, fold R. In particular, you can define map. So um, map of G of L can be defined as fold R of an F the empty list in L, where the F is, takes an X and a Y, it applies G to the X, and then cons that onto Y. And I've visualized that again. So if you kind of follow each input to this fold R, it goes through a G, and then it comes out the end. So it, it's a map. Uh, you can define fold R in, in terms of, you can define map in terms of fold R. So we needn't have bothered starting with map. We could have started with fold R. One final map-like function 
Um, instead of, so in, in the definition of map, we, on the right-hand side, we stuck an empty list into the folder. Okay. Now we're going to add a zero instead. So now we're going to say map A of G and some zero is folder of the same F as we had before, but with the zero on the right-hand side. And this does a combination of map and append. The plus plus is the thing that combines two lists to give a, a longer list. Um, so with folder, you can do something that is like a combination of map and append. And we'll use that again later in an example. Um, so now I'm going to talk about the kind of main example that Donvi and Spivey talk about in their admiration of the 1966 paper. And the main example is Cartesian product. So it relates a bit back to Phil's uh, talk from yesterday. He talked about product. So we'd like to make a function which takes a list of lists and gives us all the ways of, t of all the ways of taking one element from each of the lists. So if there were two lists only, it would be like Phil's product that he had yesterday with a product of two things. But now we have a product of many things. So for example, if we have the list A, B, and then some more stuff, how do we compute this product? We take the product of the more stuff, and we stick an A at the beginning of each element of that, of that result, and we stick a B at the, at the beginning of each element of that result. Okay. Or recursively, if the first list is A cons A's, what do we do? We take a product of the tail of the list, we stick A onto the front of every element of that result, and we also take the product of the, the, the axis that the, the tail of that list comes onto the list of elements that we have already. So there's, we're going to get a, a, a program that looks like this. This is, this is the, the first program that uh, Strachey gives in his, uh, in his uh, paper. So what does product do? It's, it, it takes a list of lists. Okay. If that is empty, then the result is going to be a list containing the empty list. That's what those funny square brackets are on the, on the first line of the definition. If uh, the, the, fir the first list is empty, so if the head of the entire list is the empty list, then the result is the empty list. This is a bit tricky. <laughs> and if we have x cons x is in the first list, and the rest of the list is x's. Then what we're going to do? We're going to take product of x's and stick x uh, at the beginning of each element of that list. So that's a map of x cons over that product. And we're going to append to that the product of the remainder of that list, cons x's. Okay, so we've got two recursive calls of product here. Um, and so we've got what we do, what they do in uh, the Donvi and Spivey paper to try to explain uh, uh, Strachey's answer is say, let's take some of these, the, 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 the calls of product that are, are um, where we know that we have a head and a tail in the end, but let's call, call some of the calls of product H. So that's all we've done here. Um, so now we have three H's uh, down at the, so some of the, the, the second call of product has been replaced by an H, which we now define. Um, so now let's look at this function. H recurses over its first input. And so the, but it calls product on its second input. This is, this is not good. So we're going to call product many times on the same input as we recurse over the first, uh, the, the x cons x's. So let's take that product, instead of doing it many times, let's do it once and for all in the definition of product. That's what happens here. Oops. Uh, we'll, we'll do product once and for all. So that's, that's reducing the number of times we call product. So we still have, 
the same behavior of this program. In fact, I had to type them all in <laughs> to convince myself that it was really true. And very worryingly, one of the papers in Strachey's, one of the, the functions in Strachey's paper was not correct. So I spent a lot of time trying to figure out why that was. Um, so we, we make a step where we uh, reduce the number of calls to product. And now, if you look at the very bottom line of this, you have a map of something followed by an append. And we saw that before. I showed you map A before. So we're going to replace that by map A. Okay. So we're getting somewhere. So now let's just do some coloring on the, on the code. We have some blue code, which is the definition of product. We have some black code, which is the definition of F. And we have map A. But each of these bits of code can be implemented with fold R. If you look at the blue code, it's exactly like the definition of fold R. If you look at the black code, it's, it's uh, like a definition of fold R. So we can just replace the blue code by a fold R and the black code by a fold R and the map A by a fold R. And we end up with this bemusing <laughs> a piece of code, which is an implementation of Cartesian product using three nested instances of Foldar. Now, in, in the Strachey paper, he just says, he just shows us the very first recursive definition. Then he shows us, in fact, a wrong, a wrong uh, definition that is more efficient. But the, I think that was just a transcription error that when Barron was transcribing from a, a tape recording of a, of a lecture. Okay. And then he just shows this. this. He says, our, even our second, our second um, uh, program is not very, uh, no, the first program is not very efficient. So we'll just re rewrite it this way. And then it turns out to be folder. And there's no explanation. He, he just wrote this down. He just knew to do this. And this, despite the fact that he had no computer on which to, to, to run any of this. Well, he was running some of his programs by transcribing them into Lisp and running them. But, but there's no evidence that he ever ran any of these fold R programs. But, but he managed to get them right anyway which is quite amazing. So if you're interested in, in uh, history of computing, go away and read the Strachey paper. It's fascinating. Or if you can't face that, read the Donvey and Spivey paper, which is also like a, a very nice paper. So we're about in 1962 or 63 still. I'm, I'm aged four. Uh, uh, what else was happening in computing at the time? Um, there was APL. How many of you have ever heard of APL? Oh, many of you. Oh, good. <laughs> um, Kenneth Iverson developed a, a language called APL in the like, early 60s, late, maybe even beginning late 50s. But he didn't implement it for, for six or seven years. This was a difference between then and now. And it was used inside IBM as a hardware description language. And, the, and they used it to verify by pencil and paper development or calculation um, some of the implementations of, of the early IBM machines, which I think is, uh, as a hardware person, that's amazing. But APL has something like Foldar. It's called reduction. And it's written with a kind of slash. So it says slash x is the same as uh, Z equals, and then it says X1 and a, a dot, we call it dotl, uh, X2, dotl, X3, and so on. So that's the same as, as Foldar. He wrote a book in 1962, which is a very interesting book to read. Uh, some of it is online, though I think not all of it. Um, he liked very concise <laughs> notations of programs, and there was a special keyboard and indeed, there still is, I notice, from the company called Dialog that sells uh, uh, an APL interpreter still. So you probably can't see it, but there's lots of funny squiggles on these keys. Okay? And, and uh, APL programs are extremely short and concise. And, and Iverson's interest was in notation, and he viewed these as mathematical notations, as an aid to thought. So he, he won the Turing Award, another Turing Award winner here, in 1979. And he wrote a great paper at that point called Notation as a Tool of Thought. That's another paper you, every computer scientist should read. Uh, it's very interesting. I've seen an APL compiler that was like written in APL that was like one A4 page. 
just of squiggles, right? So it was like, you can write a, I think it was a 17 pass APL compiler written entirely in APL. So it's an amazingly concise notation. Perhaps a bit too concise sometimes. So we're still in 1962 or three. Um, Anybody recognize this person? It's John Bacchus, another of my heroes. Um, so in 1963, he was at the top of his game. He was made a fellow of IBM in 1963. And the reason for that was that he had, um, I think between something like 54 and 57, developed the first, he had developed Fortran, and the first Fortran compiler. So that is the first high-level programming language. And the development of the compiler was done with about 10 people. Somebody said, he even hired mathematicians and women. <laughs> um, so it was, a, it was a group of about 10 people who made the Fortran compiler, and they had a, they had a whale of a time. They had a, just a fantastic time. And I have seen recent compiler talks that basically say, we haven't done much better. You know, since 1959, we haven't done much better than Bacchus did in his, his group. Um, so that was a, a tour de force to, to make the, the Fortran compiler. And he was awarded the Turing Award in 1977. Um, for that and for contributions to ways to describe programming languages, for example, the bacchus Nauer form. And he wrote a great paper, which we talked about last year in our keynote too, called can programming be liberated from the von Neumann style, a functional style and its algebra of programs? And you should all go away and read this paper. At least the first half. Okay. And he, it's a manifesto for functional programming. So even though he had you know, won the Turing Award for what he did with Fortran, this paper is a manifesto that says roughly, we've got it all wrong and we need to start again. Um, so he, it's, it's, it's quite backwards in its style. So he, he, he says, conventional programming languages are growing ever more enormous, but not stronger. Inherent defects at the most basic level cause them to be both fat and weak. And one of the defects that he talks about is their inability to effectively use powerful combining forms to, to build new programs from existing ones. Um, and that's what higher order functions, or combining forms as he called them, are all about. Now last year at the very end of our keynote, we talked about four important points of functional programming related to John's uh, Why Functional Programming Matters uh, paper, but also they're very closely related to what Bacchus says in his paper. And the four are, are combining forms, which this, this talk is about. And if you have combining forms and you define them for example, over lists or over trees, you are talking about whole values rather than talking about individual. But he talked a lot about individual words going over the von Neumann bottleneck, which he named. Okay. So combining forms and whole values kind of go together. And his, his thesis is that you have to define your combining forms in such a way that they obey simple laws so that you can reason about your programs. A fourth important point is functions as representations, and I'm not really going to talk about that here, except to say that in the Cartesian product example that I showed you, if you use a functional representation of the list, a la John Hughes, then you only need two fold R's. <laughs> so go away and play with the Cartesian product and you'll see. Um, I, I'll give a quick plug for the fish talk, because that's really about functional representations. Uh, room one at, at three o'clock today, go and see the fish talk. <laughs> what is an example of a simple law? Here's one, uh, both uh, in, in code and in my pictures. Map of F composed with map of G is the same as map of F composed with G. Now, with my hardware designer view, view of things, this doesn't make a lot of difference. They're kind of the same circuit if I'm taking a, a, you know, a map of, and, and making it into silicon, you might say. But if we're talking about software, these two programs can have very different behavior. Um, because you might think of it as there's two iterations over a list. So it's like having two loops on the left and one loop on the right. Or you might think of it as there's an intermediate list produced between the two maps. Okay, so when you're a programmer, it's important to be able to 
apply these kind of transformations and you'll get programs that behave differently. Uh, they'll have the same semantics, the same input-output behavior, but their performance might be very different. Their memory use might be very different. Here's another example of such a uh, simple law. Fold R of F and V applied to map of G-axis is the same as fold R of F composed with G and V and X's. And F composed with G is function composition, backward function, function composition, as, as Bill talked about yesterday. And these, again, will have, for similar reasons, possibly very different behavior as programs. <coughs> now, we're, we're at... No, we're at about 1979 here now, 70, 1980. I was a, a, an electrical engineering student at that time. I didn't see any functional programming in my undergraduate degree, but I did see formal methods, uh, which was very new at the time, too. Um, and I got sent off. I was in, in Ireland. I got sent off to, to Oxford uh, to study formal methods as a, for a master's degree. And this is, we were the second cohort of master's students in Oxford. And this is me with all the men. <laughs> I, I actually hadn't noticed that at the time. And nobody really said anything, but uh, uh, this is us. Uh, on the very, so o Oxford, the programming research group, was where straight she worked until the end of his life. But unfortunately, the end of his life was in 1975 before this. But straight she's spirit um, really dominated at the PRG. So you could say that the master's course that I took was uh, telling us Strachey's view of the world. Okay, it was uh, fantastic. And on the very left bottom of those rows, you see Joe Stoy, who worked a lot with Strachey. He taught denotational semantics on the course. He also taught functional programming on the course, which is where I first saw it. And uh, it was mind-blowing, <laughs> a fantastic course. We did a lot of reasoning about programs, and uh, in the middle you have Tony Hoare, who, who was follow, following on very much from Strachey's view of the world. So at, at the end of my one-year master's, I got asked to stay and do a doctorate, and I said, rather, I was a bit surprised, but I said yes. Okay. And uh, I moved into a house in Oxford with a young man called John Hughes. <laughs> We, it was just a shared student house. My, my, my supervisor had said, you know, John, John needs somebody else to live in his house. So we went, to, uh, and the rest was history. <clears throat> and um, in about 1981, we were, we were driving to a workshop in Edinburgh, and, uh, in John's ancient Ford Cortina. And um, he told me as he was driving about Bacchus's paper. And I had, had spent, you know, several months already at this point trying to design a hardware description language and then he told me about Bacchus's paper and combining forms. And I thought, oh, well, that's it. That, that's what we need for a hardware description language. So John got me into all this, you might say. And so my work was about taking Bacchus's ideas and applying them to the description of circuits and using the kinds of laws that he espoused to reason about the behavior of circuits. Here's an example of one of these laws. If you, have, if you can push a blue blob through an orange box, and get two blue blobs, then you can take something that looks like this and gradually play with the blobs, push them around, oh, sorry, and end up with this. And this is a law, if those blue blobs are unit delays, for example, then this is a rule about retiming of circuits or pipelining, it's sometimes called. And you can see exam an example of one of the combining forms that I ended up with in my description of circuits that I didn't have in my description of programs. That triangular thing came up all over the place in circuits. And in fact, it was implemented. We were talking to GEC at the time about regular circuits, and they had triangles of unit delays on their circuits. Okay, so it was nice to be able to play with real circuits. Um, in those days, we had to draw the pictures in our papers by hand. With a, with a pen, <laughs> and we had to submit the papers with, on, on paper with little, you know, pull, pasted on pictures, okay? So it was really a different process to write a paper in those days. But eventually I did manage to uh, publish a paper in 1984 about all this, and I presented it at, it was called, uh, what was it called? Lisp and Functional Programming, I think the name of the conference was. It was in Austin, and Bacchus was there. <laughs> 
And he came up to me afterwards and he said, that was the nicest use of FP I have ever seen. And I thought, okay, now I can die. <laughs> I can die and go to heaven at this point. Okay. Um, and in the end, uh, in the same year, actually, in 1984, I got a doctorate for doing that work, and John got his doctorate at the same time. So that's us looking very young. Um, for my doctorate, my internal examiner was this person, Richard Bird, on the left. And I want to tell you about the bird mertens formalism. So the bird mertens formalism was, you might say, uh, um, an approach to reasoning about programs much influenced by the ideas of Bacchus and by, by other people. So the idea with bird mertens was that you write down an inefficient version of your program and you apply simple laws to the program until you eventually get to a more efficient version. For example, in 1986, Richard wrote a, a, a monograph. He, he was at the Programming Research Group also. So he wrote a monograph called The Theory of Lists. And you should go away and read that too. It's beautiful. So this is programming as an intellectual exercise where simplicity and beauty is important. It's just wonderful stuff. Um, they tended to use quite complex notations too, a bit like APL and FP. So it was sometimes called squiggle. And it was a bit like a secret society. Um, there was, a, there was a, a journal called The Squigglist, and, and, um, which I have a few copies of, uh, published in the 80s and early 90s. And it says on the inside of it, you can't subscribe to The Squigglist. You either get it or you don't. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> this is... Uh, the, the secret society on an island in, uh, in the Netherlands in 1989. Um, so Bird and Mertens are, <coughs> you can see there are leaders, they're in the middle of the photo, and we are the disciples. Um, and one of the disciples was a young man called Graham Hutton, who actually was my, one of my first students in, in Glasgow. And I would say that he is probably the person who took the torch of Bird Mertens and, and that approach to reasoning about programs and, and, and stuck with it. And, and uh, one of the people who did that. So he writes beautiful papers uh, about programming examples. He's also written a very nice book about programming in Haskell. So if you want to learn Haskell, that's the way to do it. And he's written a paper called, uh, this was in 1999, called A Tutorial on the Universality and Expressiveness of Fold. I told him I was going to show his wedding photo, so that's him looking very Scottish. Um, <clears throat> I, asked, I asked permission to show it, and he said, yes, please do. You know, there's a story about this paper. I wanted to call it Fold, <laughs> but the editor wouldn't let me. <laughs> it's, it's published in the Journal of Functional Programming, and so uh, he says, as a result, not many people have read it. It would have been better to call it Fold. And, and this paper is... is is very beautiful. Um, he talks about the universal property of fold. So Phil talked about universal properties yesterday. So this is the universal property of fold. These two things are equivalent. So that thing over on the right is an equivalent. So if you know that G of the empty list of V is V, and G of X cons X is, is of F of X and G of X is, that's the same thing as G is fold of F and V. So that's one property of fold. And another property of fold that he brings up is a f what he calls a fusion property of fold. And that's a bit like my retiming law that I showed you before. It says, if you know that H of W is V, and H of G of X and Y is the same as F of X and H of Y, so that, this is one of these, can you push the blue blob through uh, examples, then you can rewrite the composition of H and fold R as just a single fold R. And I'll, I'll show you that in pictures because it might be easier to understand. It is for me at least. So if H applied to W is the same as V, that's the, the two left, the left of the picture. And if you can kind of push an H through a G, converting it into an F, then you can take an H and push it through a fold of G and convert it into a fold of F. Now, why is this important? Why, why do we need to know things like this? We're sitting and we're trying to calculate our programs in the Bird-Mirton style. We would like laws that 
encapsulate inductions. We don't want to apply inductions when we're doing these calculations of programs. We would like to be able to apply laws that replace inductive proofs. So that's the, the, the whole point of this. So you're, you're all you know, developers and you're thinking to yourself, this has nothing to do with me. No, I, I don't write small programs. I don't want to calculate my programs. Um, but there are ways, there are ways to um, make this easier. Um, so and here's another plug for a talk. This afternoon in room three at 1555, Max, who's here, will talk about quick spec. I'm not going to say very much about it, except that it allows you to find out laws about Haskell functions. So you have a bunch of Haskell functions. You tell quick spec which functions you're interested in. Like here we're interested in map, fold, composition, the empty list and cons. And it goes away and, and thinks. And it tells you a bunch of laws about those functions. I've taken away some of them because they were related to the definitions of the functions, but here are some interesting ones. For example, that function composition is associative. Uh, the one about map of F composed with G is the composition of maps. And the, um, the one I told you earlier about the composition of fold and map. It tells me that, and in fact it told me it in a nicer way than I had it written down before. So I had to go back and change my earlier slide. Um, <laughs> so that's quick spec is extremely cool and go to the talk and hear more about it. So why are combining forms or higher order functions it, useful and important? They capture patterns. So they are, a, they capture patterns of computation. So they are a form of abstraction and abstraction is important for uh, programming and for computer science. They support the whole value programming and that can be important um, also in the presence of uh, parallelism, for example, data parallel programming. And they enable reasoning by the programmer because they, if you define your combining forms, I think of them as being like Lego and if you define them so they fit together nicely and have nice laws, then you'll be able to reason about your programs. But here's an important point. They enable reasoning by the programmer but they also enable reasoning by the compiler, and that's important. So there's a whole uh, track of research about that. So we have another hero here. <laughs> um, Phil wrote a very famous paper called Deforestation, Transforming Programs to Eliminate Trees um, in 1990. And then there were some, so this is about um, uh, avoiding intermediate data structures. Um, and then there was a follow-up paper from about 1993 called Shortcut Deforestation by Gill, Launchbury, Peyton Jones, I think. Um, and I thought to myself, maybe I'd, I'd like to find a paper that I can, uh, that really makes this clear what this is all about. So I found then, <clears throat> actually a quite a much later paper from 2001, the Haskell Workshop, and it's called Playing by the Rules, Rewriting as a Practical Optimization Technique in GHC. And it's about the rewrite rules that you can add, for example, as a library developer when you're using GHC. So that's, you can add laws about your functions, which then GHC will apply uh, during compilation. And um, in particular, this approach was used to do what, what's called list fusion, which is the getting rid of intermediate lists. Um, and what they did was they rewrote all the prelude functions, the, the kind of standard functions in Haskell in a new way. So fold R remained as it was, the same definition as before, but they introduced a new function called build. Um, and build of G was just G applied to cons and the empty list. We, we've seen that before somewhere. And then the point is that fold R and build, when they meet each other, you can cause the intermediate list to disappear. So fold R of K and Z applied to build of G. Um, you, you don't have to first give build the cons and the empty list and then later um, give, give K and Z. You can just immediately give K and Z to, to G. Okay, so you can avoid an intermediate list by figuring out where folds and builds meet. I think of them as kind of meeting and the list, the intermediate list disappears. 
And it's a very nice paper, very easy to read, and, and it's just beautiful. Okay. <coughs> okay, so we've talked about map and fold and reasons that they are interesting. There's one more uh, higher order function I'd like to talk to you about. So we talked about fold R. There's a, there's a kind of fold L which has the arrow flowing in the opposite direction in the diagram. And to get to scan, which is my uh, final higher order function, you just take the fold L and you output all the intermediate values along the way. So it's like many calls of, uh, of, a, of a reduction. Here's the definition of it. Um, uh, uh, scan L of F, Z, and the empty list is the singleton list containing Z. And scan L of F, Z, and X cons X is, is Z cons scan L of F, and the new uh, zero is F of Z and X and X. So scan L, so fold took uh, a function, a zero, and a list, and gave you a single value. Scan L takes a function, a zero, and a list, and gives you a, li a new list. In fact, it's one, in this definition, it's one longer than the input list. So let's take an example. If we apply scan L of plus and zero to 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, we get uh, what's called the prefix sums of that list. We get zero, we get zero plus two, we get zero plus two plus four, and so on. So we get zero, two, six, 12, and so on. That's called prefix sums. And if we draw the picture, it looks like this. Okay, so the, the, there's a recursive call of scan L on axis, that's the orange part, and it both produces all of its outputs and uh, produces, uh, no, the, the F, uh, produces an output and also passes an output on uh, to the remaining uh, ScanL. So ScanL was uh, figured, figured in um, a lot of the examples that were done by the squigglers. Okay? Um, and if you want to read a nice paper about the, the use of algebraic laws in calculating programs, I think this is a nice one to choose. This again is Richard Bird, I think. <laughs> um, the, the paper is called Algebraic Identities for Program Calculation, and it looks really at map, fold, and scan, and shows calculations of programs involving them. It's from the Computer Journal in 1989. And, and so here's an example of, uh, so we saw map, map fusion, and we saw map fold fusion, and now there's a fold scan fusion, okay? So this is again about plugging together our ways of combining functions. So this is what it looks like in text. So if you combine a fold and a scan, you can rewrite it as just a fold. And this might be important. So on the top we have a scan, on the bottom we have a fold. So that's the composition of a scan and a fold. And what, what writing it as a fold is about is just, you know, combining pairs of these boxes, okay? So you can write this then as something involving F and then a fold of those yellow things, those Gs, okay? So they fit together nicely and you can review it as a fold. That's the point of this. And uh, there's a famous calculation that Richard did involving using this law and a number of other ones. I'm not going to go through all the details. This is what it looks like in the paper. And it starts with the program, applies a law, gets a new program, and so on and so on. It's called a maximum segment sum. So you take, you take all the segments of the list, you map sum over that, and then you take the maximum. And this is the Fibonacci of, our, of program calculation. If you want to study program calculation, you should look at this example. And the very last law that he applies of the, I think there are seven or eight laws applied, is the, the scan L fold fusion that we saw before. And the whole point of this, is, apart from the beauty and insight that you get from doing these calculations, is that the original program is order n cubed and the final program is order n. So you are changing the 
you have the same semantics of your program in terms of input-output, but you may have very different performance of the programs. Okay. So go away and read that paper too. <laughs> um, and SCAN is of interest for other reasons than reasoning about sequential programs. Um, when you add parallelism to the mix, SCAN becomes especially interesting. So if you are on a sequential machine, the data dependencies demand that you just do, if you're trying to do a scan, you, the data dependencies demand that you just do each F in turn. Okay. But, but algorithms people have studied scan for a long time and they've developed a special diagram for showing uh, compositions of functions that, that perform scan. So the diagrams show uh, data flowing in and down and along the wires, think of them as abstract wires. The black dots are the Fs, or the functions, okay? So this is a, a picture of a sequential scan. It does, time is flowing downward, so it, it does, it, it uh, combines the first two input values, and then it combines and, and produces some output, and then it takes the next input value, and then the next element of the list, and so on. But it turns out that even though that looks very sequential and linear, there are, if you know that the function is associative, then you can do it much more efficiently. In fact, you can do it in log depth. Okay, this is surprising and interesting. And these, these things get implemented as circuits uh, all the time. So if you look at a microprocessor and do a heat map of a microprocessor, the hot spots will be the prefix circuits. Okay. Because that, Intel doesn't like to make slow circuits, so it makes very, no, very uh, shallow circuits. And uh, this particular version, so here we're, we're, we're inputting 0, 1, 2, and so on. And at each box, we're adding two values. Uh, so for example here, 0, 1 gets added to produce 1. 1, 2 gets added to produce 3. So we, we add together each adjacent pair. And once we've done that, it turns out that we can just recursively call the same function on the even elements of the list and on the odd elements of the list. Okay. So we get then a log depth scan program or circuit. And in fact, there are many, many different ways to do log depth scan circuits. It's a whole research area of its own. And it's fascinating. <laughs> um, I've, worked, I've spent quite a lot of time in the, uh, that black hole. It's a very interesting black hole. But I'd like to come back to a paper by Strachey. Um, this is it. This is the entire paper. So not only has he written a paper called Programming, he's written a paper called Bitwise Operations. <laughs> it's fantastic. You see why he's my hero, right? We're trying to reverse the bits of half of a word into the other half of the word. Okay, so that's what he's trying to do here. So let's, there's a picture at the bottom which I'll try to explain. So, for some reason, we have 11 bits. It's probably related to the Pegasus, but we have 11 bits and we'd like to reverse them over into the other half of the word. So let's imagine that we have them reversed, okay? And let's count the distance that A has to travel and that B has to travel and that C has to travel, okay? So A has to travel one, B has to travel three, C has to travel five. Let's figure out what is the binary representation of those distances. And then in a program, what we're going to do is first move all those together that need to move 16, and then move all together those that need to move eight, and then four, two, and one. So this is a log depth bit reversal program from 1960. So it, it basically contains the same idea as the scan circuit that I showed you just before. It's very similar. And that was from 1973. Uh, so Strachey invented nearly everything, I think it's fair to say. Um, one of the, the power of SCAN is, uh, ha, has been very well described by a, 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 a professor from CMU called Guy Blelock. He's written a completely fantastic paper called Prefix Sums and Their Applications. And he explains basically that nearly whatever you want to do in the algorithms line, you can do with scan. 
and he has long lists and programming examples, and it's fantastic. Read that paper too. And if you go looking for, G if you read GPU papers these days, you will find that they contain pictures that look just like the scan circuits that I've been showing you. And, and scan is very important in the GPU, GPU world too. And you might regard scan as a kind of uh, encapsulation of a very standard form of, of, of uh, computation. And, and a colleague who was at Glasgow at one point, Edinburgh first and then Glasgow when some of us were there, was called Murray Cole. And he introduced the idea of skeletons as capturing generic patterns of, of parallelism. And he wrote, in, in his PhD thesis, he, he first of all wrote his thesis and then wrote a book later about it, uh, he turned it into a book. Examples of such patterns are stencils, wave fronts, divide and conquer, task, farm, and so on. And the idea is that we give the user these quite higher level ways to, to describe programs, and it's up to the runtime system to provide good implementations for the different platforms of the various forms of computation. And there's a nice survey paper about that. So it's, it's taken, it, it's, it happens both in the, no, in the functional world and in the non-functional world. So this paper is about both of those. <clears throat> and, and these skeletons that, that Murray and others studied are closely related to higher order functions. In fact, if you look at the preface of that book, Murray says, thank you, John Hughes, for explaining to me <laughs> that uh, skeletons are closely related to higher order functions. Okay. Um, so where are we now? Have we solved everything? Um, you know, am I telling you that we, you, know, you just need to go away and program in terms of higher order functions and we're all done? And I fear that we're, it's not the case. So let's think about the systems we need to program today. Heter parallelism is here to stay and just getting more and more, and heterogeneity is here to stay. You know, we're going to have all kinds of crazy accelerators, uh, FPGAs, GPUs, and so on. We might have good ways to program individual types of accelerators, but now we're faced with the prospect of programming this mess. Uh, so I think it feels like we're back in 1959. In order to program this mess, we need to think about a lot of low-level details to get it right. So I think, so Bacchus was interviewed in 2006, uh, a, year, a little bit before he died in 2007, and he was asked, you know, what, sh what should programming language designers do now? And he said this, the question of it still seems that programming is a pretty low-level enterprise, and that somebody ought to be thinking about how to make it higher, really higher level than it is. And I think that's what we need to, to think about still. So if we're going to program that mess, we need all kinds of ways of dealing with the fact that we need to deal with low-level details without overwhelming the programmer. We need to talk about expressing and controlling locality of data. Security has become an issue. We hear, heard about smart contracts and blockchain yesterday. We need to ensure correctness for, the, for these kinds of reasons. And we need to do things like control power consumption. So the days when we could just view a, a single sequential computer as something abstract that we could easily program are gone. Um, there are some advantages to this because it means that we researchers can get money <laughs> to think about these problems. So we and the, the information security, we functional programmers in the information security group led, so in a project led by Alfando Russo. We just got 31 million Swedish kroner from the Swedish Strategic Research Agency to think about exactly these problems. Um, so we're going to be hiring doctoral students. So uh, if you fancy coming to Shalmers and working, uh, please do apply once we've advertised. <laughs> um, so I'm going to end with this very famous quote from Strachey. So we were told this quote all the time when I was a master's and doctoral student uh, in Oxford. And it says, it has long been my personal view that the separation of practical and theoretical work is artificial and injurious. Much of the practical work done in computing, both in software and in hardware design, is unsound and clumsy because the people who do it have no, not any clear understanding of the fundamental design principles of their work. Most of the abstract mathematical and theoretical work is sterile because it has no point of contact with real computing. And 
I, I tended to think at that time, oh, he's a theoretician. It's very nice for him to say these things, but you know, I don't really believe. But then I have now since discovered all the amazing things he has done, like designing computers and so on. So now I understand that he was speaking from real knowledge when he admonished us to bring together theory and practice. And um, I hope that you'll go away and read some of the papers I pointed to you, and that we can continue in Lambda Days to bring together these two parts of computer science. Thank you.